This is the story of the rise of American fencing, the athletes who forged ahead where others had failed, and Coach Bucky Leach, who led the way. At the start of Bucky's career, the path to success in American fencing was dimly lit, with very few successes to illuminate the way forward. Along this untrodden path, there were missteps and stumbles and bumps and bruises, which are reflected on by Coach Leach. Bucky speaks of his personal philosophy, the athletes who made success possible, and memorable moments along the way. He shares his readiness to question himself and his continuous quest to be a better coach. Coach Leach had indeed guided the USA women's foil team through historic groundbreaking performances at the cadet, junior, and senior world championships of fencing, making significant inroads at the highest level of competition. Eventually, the women's foil team would reach the pinnacle of international fencing with a gold medal in the Team World Championships in 2018 with the team of Nicole Ross, the Zynga Prescott, Lee Kiefer, and Margaret Liu, and an individual gold by Lee Kiefer in the Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games. I'm John Heil, sports psychology consultant to the women's foil team and to Coach Leach through two Olympic Games. I also led the sports medicine and science programs for USA Fencing for 15 years. I am Stacy Johnson, an international women's foil fencer, Olympian, and past USA Fencing president. As a strong supporter of sports psychology, I hired Dr. Heil to work with U.S. fencing. I have known Coach Leach since he started fencing as a teenager at the U.S. Modern Pentathlon Training Center in San Antonio, Texas. We are both pleased to share the story of a unique moment in American fencing and the journey of this exceptional American coach. The interview conducted in 2011 was at the moment when American fencing was emerging as the world power it is today and at a critical juncture in the life journey of Bucky Leach. This was a time when Bucky was reflecting on lessons from the past, reorienting himself, and setting a course towards a better future. This is a two-part video. The first is focused on coaching philosophy and the second details memorable moments on the journey to success. Coach Bucky Leach speaks candidly, and in some cases surprisingly, about his passion for coaching and the struggles in finding a path toward international success. In an unvarnished way, Bucky shares successes and failures and the personal struggles that were a part of the team's journey. He reflects on the mindset of the fencer and competitive pressure, on dealing with adversity and self-doubt, and with innovations in the search for success. I enjoy that process of co coaching. I'm not sure, and I've never really been sure, that it, it was necessary. It, I think it was coaching that I enjoyed, not necessarily the fencing so much when I started. I could have done, uh, I could have been a swim coach, uh, uh, I was thinking about uh, riding, um, being a, a riding instructor, something like that. And it was the, the coaching people that was interesting to me. Um, fencing was a sport that I had stayed with and had done okay in, and, uh, and I felt it fairly well. So uh, I think I went in that direction. But it, it's not like uh, I enjoy fencing. Um, I really enjoy coaching, but I don't, you know, some people have a huge, real intense love for the sport. Um, for me, it's the sport that I'm coaching, and I try to learn as much about it as I can, but I don't know that I, I've ever had that, like, intense love for the sport. Mm -hmm. But the coaching, I like, yeah. okay. if that makes sure. some sense. So, uh, how about a comment on fencing as physical chess, or checkers, risk, monopoly? <laughs> um, yeah, I, yeah, people say physical chess. I, I'm, 
I tend to go into the physical checkers kind of uh, thought. It's, it's a complicated sport, um, and there, the tactics that go on are, are difficult, but not the tactics aren't that difficult. The, the, the mentality that you have to have and the strength that you have to have in, in that area is, is huge. But uh, um, it does take a, because you have offense, defense, you have everything combined, it's, it's really a challenging sport to, to understand. Mm -hmm. okay. But I would go with the check, kind of the physical checkers, because it happens much, much faster. What were you trying to change about the game in terms of te technical aspects of the game, tactical aspects of the game? Um, well, I, I think it, uh, there's a couple parts. In the States, I was trying to change the work ethic of the fencer. And that was the biggest, the biggest step we had to take, is to say that uh, our runners, our basketball players, our swimmers, our, all of these, these athletes you know, are, are, have succeeded in, in Olympics. And, and uh, basically because we have a good system and we have athletes who are willing to work very hard, um, and what we have to do is bring some of that thought into fencing. So uh, um, I stepped up the, the work that the athletes did. Um, um, the other thing I thought was that um, women had traditionally kind of been coached in a certain way, and I felt that, uh, uh, and they were coached differently than the men were coached. And my thought was that why are we coaching them so much differently than the men? Uh, you know, there wasn't an emphasis on tactics as much. Um, it, the idea was that women, it's just all feeling and, and you, you know, to try to teach them tactics is... When it, with a lot of international competitors, the coaches, if, if the women wouldn't perform or would do something that didn't make any sense, their response would be, it's women. So we try to train them a little bit more like, like we train the guys and, and teach them defense like the guys and teach them to process the information that they were getting and, and to understand tactics a little bit more and, and uh, fence that way. Um, now I've, I do similar, but uh, um, I've allowed that feeling side of it to come into it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So that, that it's tactics, understanding the sport, but also you can't, you, you can't leave the fact that they're women and, they ha and, and this is the way their minds work a little bit. You can't leave that out of there. You have to include that in there to be able to succeed. Uh, Gary Copeland once explained to me what you did is you taught people to really wait what Gary Copeland told us, wait to the last possible second before you made your choice in the action. Is that...? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's... I probably... It's a kind of a good and a bad thing. Um, one of the problems with it is that they tend to wait, instead of initiating and creating the action sometimes, they, they tend to, to wait until they're just a, a, like a, just a slight step behind because they're waiting a little bit too much. They, they need to anticipate better, but that, that would be kind of accurate. Well, I try not, I haven't, you know, like Gary has probably analyzed what I do far more than I've ever analyzed what I do. Often Paul Soder uh, said one, you know, he, I think Mike Peterson asked, how come Bucky doesn't talk about fencing all that much? And, and basically it's, or t talk about what's going on. It's very uh, intuitive for me. So when I'm, when I'm teaching, when I'm working, the whole process has, has, has a big part of it has been pretty intuitive rather than that thought out because my mind just doesn't work that way. My, my thought was that if you could deal with everything with me and you could deal with what you were going to get in this lesson and in this intense moment that you could deal with whatever was thrown at you. Um, I'm not sure that I, I think it worked for me um, but, I, but you know, I, I've worked with so many different coaches that some of them never create that in a lesson and it's always a uh, um, it's always a very positive, a very uh, calm environment, and their athletes are, are in incredibly successful doing it that way. So I, um, I know what I know that I don't function as well as that kind of coach. I've tried it a couple times, and and um, I don't have the emotion that I need to have to be able to to drive an athlete to succeed. So my I have to be true to the way I coach to make it successful. What, what makes your lessons so difficult or challenging? Me. I <laughs> just just uh, my nature. I, I tend to want, um, and this is really not in life at all, but just in fencing. It uh, uh, is I want what I want, and and I, and I know what I want, and I and I and you're going to keep doing this until you get exactly what I want. Um, so and I and I can't. I don't have an ability to to move on to something else. Like if something doesn't work, um, to go on to something else and then come back to it. Um, if something's not working, you're gonna, you could be there for an hour trying to get that to work. 
Um, and I think you know that's it's not the best way to do it, but also the athlete uh, um, just drives themselves to make it work. Uh, in a competitive situation, the question really is uh, tolerance of the discomfort of the tension of the moment, and, mm -hmm. and maybe some people will break, uh, will break, or maybe they'll, they'll actually just move too quickly. They'll get on the line, to the line too quickly. They'll take the first chance instead of the best chance. You know, they'll mm -hmm. they'll, they'll, they'll they'll succumb to the pressure of the time, and, yeah. and that, yeah. that's that the psychological tension rather than settle into it and try to exploit it. Yeah, and it's very difficult to get an athlete to understand or to be able to feel, to feel that it's uh, that anxiety and uh, and the desire to win, you know. And, and a lot of them are are so tied up with the desire to win rather than to just to fence. Um, and I see that now more than I ever saw with any of the athletes, the older group of athletes that that, that I had. Um, now it's about just winning and getting points, and all of that gets creates more anxiety, and then they, they're not able to play, to play the game. Mm -hmm. And if you can kind of get in your head that you're going to play this game, then you give yourself time to do stuff. You can try actions. You, you, don't, uh, um, you, you don't have the anxiety, but that's, that's difficult to, to achieve. I think it, it started to give everybody the feeling that they could succeed. So we tried to train them a little bit more like, like we would train the guys. We have to take care of each other because this guy's nuts. Feeling side of it to come into it a little bit more. It's, it's very uh, intuitive for me. The stories that Bucky Leach shares reflects the very rise of American fencing. His struggles are part of the changes reflected in the history of the time in which he coached, and also the evolution of women in the sport occurring at that same time. Challenges were many in this Eurocentric sport that was not friendly to the United States. There was a brutal international travel schedule which was more advantageous to Europeans, and the presumption from men that women could not tolerate a rigorous training schedule. But Coach Leach's athlete successes were first and foremost a psychological triumph. They began to crack open the egg of success, first believing within themselves, then demonstrating that winning was indeed possible and they were going to make it happen. These doubts about being able to achieve had been so deep-seated and pervasive in the U.S. that Coach Bucky Leach reflected on the possibility of leaving the sport altogether. In sharing some of his most memorable moments, Bucky reveals the struggles, successes, and setbacks on the journey to athletic achievement and the belief that U.S. women could meet these challenges. He offers his perspective on the challenge of balancing the individuals and the team as a whole, where the women were friends at one moment, but maybe foes in the next, and ultimately, how the success of women's foil was indeed a collective effort. I remember one, uh, one competition we had in Montreal, and it was, a, uh, it was an event where there were eight people in the final, and if, um, or the semifinal, and four went up into the, into the final of eight from two pools. And uh, the one pool had Iris, Anne, Felicia, um, Susie Paxton, and I think Susan Jennings, they were all in the same pool. And they were all kind of talking about it with each other, and, and uh, Iris just said to them, uh, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I'm going up. And, you know, uh, and, and they were all mad at Iris because, uh, um, you know, it was like, 
what do you mean you're going up like putting us down a little bit and, and in Iris's mind it was like I don't know about you guys but I'm gonna fight to go up and you guys should fight to go up and we should all fight to go up. that was her mind that was her thinking as a put so it was just kind of interesting the way her mind worked though and Susie Paxton was uh, actually I can't really forget about her she she was probably the most driven athlete that uh, um, she had a bout with uh, about a six foot two tall Polish woman and uh, um, Barbara Sevchek was her name, and it was uh, her desire to win that bout was was kind of indicative of her whole uh, um, her whole fencing career. She would she went after Barbara. Uh, she was behind and started to catch up and just started to chase Barbara down and started hitting her, hitting her, hitting her. I think that her enthusiasm in that one bout got the referee so enthused that I think even a touch that might have, a couple touches that might have been Barbara's, he just gave Susie because she was so intensely excited about, about doing that. Olga, Jane Hall, they were all in, in Rochester training and they used to come into practice every day and just battle with each other. They all trained and worked very hard and one of them would come back from a World Cup and have a success. Another one would tell me about it and would be excited that they had a, had a, had a success. I, I just, um, was watching the Cadet World Championships from 95, the one Iris was the first time she won the Cadet World Championships, and in the background you can hear Aaron the whole time, Aaron with like this piercing high voice yelling for Iris, and we were both watching it, and, and we, you know, you, we kind of forgot, you know, the, the, how strong a relationship those two had as they grew up together in the, in the sport. This group was one that felt like, look, they did well, now I'm gonna do well. So rather than saying they did well, damn, you know, I wish they didn't do well because, you know, that hurts me. Instead, they said they did well, now I'm going to be the one that does well. And they kind of fed off of that. They lived, uh, you know, some of them, they lived together in a house for a little while. Um, but really, uh, it, everything worked out very well. So I think that they kind of bonded. We have to be nice to each other. We have to take care of each other because this guy's nuts. With the initial success of the women's foil team came a tremendous level of excitement within the American fencing at large. The women's successes created hope and raised expectation within U.S. fencing, and with that came even greater pressure as well. The organization was excited. You know, it was, it was uh, like Felicia made the, uh, the finals of the World Championships, I think, in 90 two was in Athens um, and this was the first time we had uh, like a woman in the final in, in, in quite a while um, so everybody was and she was only 18 19 very excited about that then she then when Iris won the cadet world championships and we had never heard the national anthem at a world championship so uh, uh, and I know there were people who had been around the organization for a long time who you know that was very exciting, especially for them, to see the ones that were there at the event, it was, it was very exciting for them to see that. So, um, you know, and any time you hear, you know, the national anthem and you see athletes, it's always a, kind of a, you know, a, like a, a, a touching moment. The athletes, as they started to succeed, felt some pressure, you know, to, to keep succeeding. I certainly did feel pressure to keep succeeding. Um, and, I, and I think that was one of the things um, that's difficult to deal with, because when you're the only one when you're, all, you're really the only group succeeding, all of the expectation falls on you, and then when that expectation gets higher and higher, it's hard, obviously, it becomes more challenging to succeed. If I remember correctly, a pretty important win. First uh, World Cup team competition win in uh, Cuba. Wins world team, is that? Oh, that against Russia? Against Russia, yeah. Against Russia. Um, yeah, that was, uh, I think, um, that was a big one for Anne and Felicia in, in particular. Um, I, and I don't remember that many different matches, but I, I do remember that one because I, I know uh, uh, I was sitting next to Anne and Felicia had her bout and Felicia, we were behind and Felicia was coming back and, uh, and she gets within a certain number of points and Anne says to me, okay, I can do that. That, that was pretty exciting. And, and I think for the, for the world, you know, to, to see us, to, you know, they had seen us start to succeed. Um, and it was one of the first ones where we really did, did well as a as well, well as a team. Let's jump ahead to the uh, Atlanta Olympics. Mm -hmm. what, what was the what went right and what didn't go right there? Um, I think it was the first Olympics for for a lot of for all of us except for Anne. Anne was Anne had been to the Olympics before in '92. Um, what went right was that we 
made it to the Olympics. The result, and made the final there, so the result was, was that was a, a good result. And then after that, you know, that was for me, that was to win the, to make it to the eight, that was a critical thing. And then when we didn't, then I was pretty unhappy, and I, I think uh, we should have performed better after that. And that was really probably my fault that we didn't perform as well as we could after that. As in most successful athletic journeys, there were wins and then some really heartbreaking moments. Coach Leach and the team kept finding ways to push forward. In the World Championships in Seoul, Korea in 1999, Iris was recovering from a knee injury but somehow managed to prevail, winning a bronze medal. And Seoul was great. She, uh, um, you know, our first uh, senior senior medal. Um, uh, she fenced with uh, Giovanna Trellini, who, you know, was obviously like a, a hero to her, and uh, not to me also. I, you know, I always like, Trellini's fencing was always uh, she was always one of my favorite fencers. When I was fencing Trellini, it was an honor. It was unbelievable. I couldn't believe it. I. I wanted, I would, I wanted anything, everything. I would have given anything to have fenced her. And um, I was actually behind. I ended up being 12-8. I kept getting touch after touch. I was just focused on getting touches. That was it. Like, how am I going to get the next touch? How am I going to get the next touch? So I was very present in the moment. And, uh, and then somehow I get the 15th touch. I mean, I just, I couldn't. I could have gone, kept going after that. That's the weird part, because I was just so intense about playing the game with her and going touch after touch that I wasn't even thinking about, okay, we're going 15. <laughs> uh, I remember uh, in Seoul we were talking. Uh, things that, the, there was sort of a little bit of a drought mm -hmm. before Seoul in terms of yeah. successes and so forth. And I think you were, we were actually talking about you getting a job at a D3 school and teaching. Oh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. The afternoon before Iris actually won the Bronze medal. <laughs> Do you remember that? Um, I I, I kind of remember just uh, um, every once in a while thinking that uh, this isn't the you know that maybe this wasn't the way, the way to go. Um, you know, you always have you always have your your doubts. You know, and then, and then uh, I think I tend to I tend to have them a lot. I, I tend to think you know, am I doing the right thing? Does this make any sense? And then something will, good will happen, and then I'll I'll continue on from there. Um, Probably a lot of those thoughts helps to drive me on or try to learn a little bit more, figure out what I, what I need to do to succeed. I, I think there was a point in my life where I said that, or maybe it was early, maybe it was 90, I don't know, maybe it was one of those. Uh, I'd said, either I'm going to have to have an athlete have a good international result, and if I don't, it means that Americans can't do it or I'm not a good enough coach to do it. And uh, if it doesn't happen within this short period of time, I'm just going to be a recreational coach and kind of just do it for fun and, and let it go or maybe find something else to do. And, uh, and then Felicia was, she got the, the bronze medal in, uh, in Bonn in that competition and that's, that kind of uh, drove me to, uh, to really continue my, uh, that process. Hopes were high approaching the Sydney Olympics with eyes on an elusive Olympic medal. The team performed well but ultimately lost the team bronze medal in a close and controversial bout against Germany. We had a good match to make the final four at the Olympics was big to beat Hungary was because uh, that's the team that we we never were able to beat in the past. Um, so that was a good result final four and then to just miss it by a couple touches. Um, uh, uh, we missed it by a couple touches where the ant had gotten a uh, a yellow card for covering target. She was coming back and doing fairly well against the German opponent. Um, the German opponent was, was strong, so, uh, um, but then at 43, 40, 40, 43, 43, the German hit Anne, and she also got a red card for turning, and the match ended at that because it went to 45. Um, I don't, you know, it's probably still about a you know, 60 to 70 percent chance that Germany is going to win because Koenig was fencing well, but it would have been nice to have it in our own hands rather than in the, uh, the hands of the, the referee at that point. The following year in the 2001 World Championships, the team moved through the preliminary rounds to again face Germany for the bronze medal. Team USA entered the final bout nine touches down. 
In an amazing come-from-behind performance, Anne Marsh dominated the bout winning 45-42 to and avenging the ill-fated loss in the Sydney Olympics. But I know fencing with Germany, we were behind. Um, Anne Marsh had always been very strong with Sabina Bao. So our, uh, we were a little bit behind. Sabina and Anne were the last bout in that event. And um, uh, Sabina didn't want to fence Anne. So they took Sabina out and put Mueller in. Well, at this point, uh, um, uh, Vladimir Neslimov was the captain with me. And Vladimir is always very, uh, is, he exudes an awful lot of confidence and charisma. And, and, and uh, um, the girls felt, I think, very confident with, with him around. And uh, Vladimir says, OK, this is it. We have this now. And uh, I, obviously, he didn't say it quite that way. He said it in, in his uh, manner. And uh, uh, Anne went out there and was very confident and just, uh, uh, just killed uh, Anya. And we, we ended up with the, the bronze medal. Uh, what was the atmosphere like after that? Oh, it was, it was crazy. It was, I remember uh, who came running down? Somebody came running down, tripped over the, uh, uh, the wall that they had placed there in the way. And uh, um, it, it, was, yeah, it was fantastic. Cadets, you know, you, you succeed in cadets. That's one thing. You succeed in junior. That's good. But the senior is really where, uh, where everything counts even more so the Olympics, but the, the senior world championships, that's, uh, that's huge. And to, and to break into the four and to, to have a medal, that was great for us. Uh, what do you think the impact is of what the women's photo did in terms of fencing in general and fencing moving forward? I think it, it started to give everybody the feeling that they could succeed. You know, this is a, a, a group of athletes who aren't that much different than any of us. Um, and all of a sudden we see them succeeding after not having a lot of years of success in, in any of the, in, in most of the weapons. Um, and everybody started to feel like, yeah, we, we could do this. And it was difficult, even when we had a talented athlete, for them to break into the, the higher standings just because the system was, was set against them. Um, now we had a group of athletes who was willing to train, willing to travel, willing to, you know, either, you know, who had parents who were willing to spend their money or they were willing to overextend their credit cards um, because they had this dream of making, making an Olympic team or being an Olympic champion. So it was a combination of all of that at the time that made it, that made it work very well. Um, I think you know, I, we were lucky that that group of individuals was as driven and as, uh, um, as willing to put out as much of themselves. Bucky loved riding his motorcycle. It gave him a sense of peace and freedom and provided a time for reflection. His travels also offered an opportunity to reconnect with athletes from earlier times and find joy in who they had become in life. It was fun. It was, uh, that was the best time I've had in a long time, partly because it was um, hundreds and hundreds of miles of not talking to anybody and just being away from everything and just um, not that I think about very much when I'm out there. I just kind of like ride around and, and just feel good about looking at the, looking at the world. Um, but then um, spending a couple of days with Iris, I spent a couple of days with uh, Julie Mahoney in Canada. Um, spent a couple of days with uh, Anne Marsh, uh, um, and it's it was Susan Jennings. It's it was good to reminisce about. Uh, uh, about the fun that we had had in, in those, uh, those times, because it was an exciting time to be, that was the first time. So it was, uh, um, everything was new to me, it was new to them, and uh, uh, it was just like a big adventure the, the whole time. So to talk about how that was, was, was good. Now it's, it's still an adventure. When you get a new group of athletes, it's kind of exciting because it's new to them, but it's, you know, it's not new to you, so it, it has a little bit different, uh, different feel to it. But uh, um, I had a great time. Uh, and, and you get to know them in, in a different way, you know, that now they're having, they're married, they're having kids, uh, um, you know, it's uh, uh, a different way of, uh, of doing them, so. On August 14th, 2021, just three weeks after Lee Kiefer's gold medal in the Tokyo Olympics, Bucky Leach suffered a fatal motorcycle accident. He was traveling to the club where he had started his coaching career in Rochester, New York. 
U.S. is indeed indebted to his enormous contributions to American fencing.